the directed by John Woo label, is today recognized internationally as the hallmark for high-octane, stylish action films. John's films have changed the face of all contemporary action films in the world. He is a genius, I think. He does things with cameras, multiple cameras, camera speeds, intercutting between different speeds and camera movements and so on, which to me always make me think of somebody playing three-dimensional chess. I love human drama more than action. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, of course, I love action film, you know, they get that, but, uh, uh, but my kind of action is, is uh, have, uh, have some meaning. So. John's unique vision is clashed head on with established conventions of filmmaking with its rigid genre stereotypes, both in Hong Kong and Hollywood. Uh, action is action. Uh, the, the action have never involved with the uh, heavy drama. And, uh, you know, uh, drama is drama. They will never mix up with the action. Along the way, John has encountered those who believed in him and the kind of films he wants to make. There was a lot of artists that really loved his work, including me. So I knew he had the ability. And that's when you, you go with artistry first. Today, John Wu is at the top of his game. But his journey from a poor boy in Hong Kong to an A-list Hollywood director wasn't easy. He never gave up. You know, when he encountered some difficulties, he was just trying to find ways to solve those problems and try to, you know, do, do it better. You know, all my life, you know, there's so many people, you know, give me a lot of uh, good opportunity uh, to work. And uh, there's a lot of good friends uh, who uh, give me a lot of help, you know. Uh, that's my fortune. Hong Kong paparazzi clamors for the best vantage points. They're here for film director John Woo, the Hong Kong native who's made it big in the West. He's on a world tour to promote his latest film, and this is the stop he looks forward to most. Home, Hong Kong. When he left over a decade ago to seek his fortunes in Hollywood, he never dreamed he'd be the center of such admiration from peers and fans alike. Yeah. Uh Every time when I got here, I can't wait to see my friend and my family. It's always exciting to be here, you know, it's so uh, it's, it's really hard to sleep. Too many thinking, too emotional. John's return to Hong Kong is a return to where it all began. His old haunts, the streets of Hong Kong. This is my favorite gun, you know, the murder. Okay, I've used it in several of my movies. 
I think this guns are pretty sexy. You know, it's like uh, James Bond types, a little tiny you know, gun, but it's, it looks with so much powerful. Chow Yun Fat hold it, you know, like uh, Alan DeLong or like uh, uh, Clint Eastwood, and he looked, uh, he looked so, so looked so elegant, and so you know, and sometimes even looks so cool, you know, such a thing. What became the quintessential John Woo film was a reflection of the conditions he grew up in. I've seen so many violence. I've seen so many crime. You know, I've seen the, quite a few of gang fights. I've seen the people chopping each other with knives. You know, when I woke up, the first thing in my mind was to just try to grab something as a weapon because I got to protect myself. And I knew whenever I ran out of the alley, I would get ambushed. I would get punched, I would get knocked out, you know, and I got bleeding all the time. So I got to fight back, I got to fight very hard to survive. In the year of 1950, you know, the, the, I mean, the house was pretty much the same, but the only thing, uh, the only big difference was that there were no gates, uh, no, no air condition, no private uh, toilet, you know, all we could, uh, all we could do was that we would, we would share the holes, you know, for every family, and also share the uh, uh, the pipe, and and usually we use it as a little toilet, uh, so we so we pee you know, by the by the pipe, you know, like a, you know, going to the, to the drain <laughs> downstairs. At that time, there were two uh, two places I used to go: the church and the theater. So whenever I feel upset, whenever I got beat up, or or whenever I feel unhappy, I either go to the church or or go to the theater. Everything was so beautiful in the musical. The, the people were beautiful, and the, the, the song was so beautiful, and the, uh, the wardrobe and the set was so beautiful. And also, the people feel there was always a hope. Uh, you know, uh, there, there are always a nice people in this world. I love musical, and I find my heaven in a, a musical. The larger-than-life images of the silver screen captured young John's imagination, a perfect foil to the harsh realities of his life, and the beginning of a dream to become John Wu, the actor. These days, as often as his schedule allows, John Wu enjoys playing mentor to budding filmmakers. They remind him of his early days trying to break into the business. I was uh, very impressed what you do. You know, I mean, the, in the old time, we didn't have that much money, you know, for uh, doing anything. Uh, at that time, we were uh, rather starving, you know, to, for uh, saving money uh, to buy the buy the film, and, you know, and, and and to make the film. Uh, I took every job. I also took the job as as, as a uh, Wonton noodles uh, uh, deliver, you know. Whenever I make some money, and I save the money, most, most of the money, uh, buying the film. Pin 
It was the 60s, and John Woo set his heart on a career as an actor. He needed to be discovered, and the gates of Shaw Brothers, then one of the largest film studios in the world, beckoned. I really wanted to be an, an actor. I started as a, a stage actor. You know, I have an actor, so uh, uh, some of play, you know, so I, I love acting. But John Woo, the would-be actor, was just one of hundreds of hopefuls at Shaw. Shaw Brothers had 12 sound stages, film processing labs, even an acting school. A film factory, which at its peak, turned out 40 films a year. He befriended Shaw superstars David Chiang and T. Long, who were supportive of his dreams to be an actor, despite the odds being stacked against him. At that time, for the actor, you know, they got to be handsome and got to be uh, six feet tall, you know, and uh, have a good body, you know, and a pretty face, you know. But I didn't got a uh, pretty face. Uh, at, at that time, the people didn't believe in uh, the character actor. But John still believed he'd be noticed by one of Shaw's directing greats, the master of the sword fighting genre, Zhang Jie, who was very particular about his heroes. John Wu was made Zhang Chair's assistant. He hoped this was his big break. Sometimes uh, Zhang Xie uh, told me, okay, now you tell uh, Chen Guan Tai and, and do uh, this kind of action, say this line, you know. I uh, demonstrated for Chen Kun Tai or Ti Long, you know, and I acted at the you know, scene. And I act, oh, like, ah, you're going to crawl down, and you're painful, and then you say the line, you know, and I act pretty, uh, pretty well. And, and they all look at me, and they were shocked. I saw that he liked to act in his own films. There was one time uh, when uh, Chen Chen got to start to make a movie called um, The Young People. He needed a third uh, uh, major lead for the movie. David Chang and Ti Long, uh, they were highly recommended me to, uh, for Zhang Chen. They even hired the cameraman and the, the makeup person and even the, you know, they hired the studio, uh, tried to uh, you know, give me a, a, a screen test. And I tried to show that to Zhang Chen, tried to convince him uh, to uh, uh, give me the part. Zhang Chen, uh, he stopped everything and he didn't let them to do it. Zhang Chen said, uh, John Wu uh, better uh, focus on the directing better, you know. Well, I was so surprised because, uh, you know, since I, uh, like I said, you know, the, I, I couldn't see my future and I didn't know what to do, you know, and, and I couldn't see myself, but he saw it and he knew it and he knew my, my ability. He helped me to make a decision, you know. Zhang Chia's absolute certainty about where John's talents lay set him on a different path, not in front of the camera, but behind it. He immersed himself into Zhang Jie's world of swordplay, a world where the protagonists were bound by a strict code of honor. A friend wronged must be avenged, even at the risk of death. This penultimate act of self-sacrifice brings great honor, and death is violent yet lyrical. I have great admire of uh, Chang Che, you know, I love his movies. I, I, I must say that I've got so much influence from this film. Uh, for the action, the sequence, like the way he uses slow motion. But what I really admire him is uh, he really got the spirit, a spirit of uh, a couple of honor, loyalty, and chivalry. I also have learned so much about uh, the beauty of the body movement, the beauty of the uh, martial arts, uh, so, and every movement and every action was so precise. The time John spent in apprenticeship with Shaw's directing greats would pay off. In 1973, at the age of 27, he left Shaw Brothers to make his first film, a martial arts movie called Young Dragons. 
he had become the youngest feature director in Hong Kong. I was so thrilled, you know, I, I, I was so, you know, I, I, exciting, you know. <laughs> Even though it was a typical martial art uh, action movie, but it also had a, a very romantic love story. All of a sudden, I've got a call, you know, from uh, Golden Harvest, uh, from Mr. Uh, uh, Leon Hall. And then uh, he set up a meeting with me, you know. When I met him, you know, I was really, you know, shaky at the time, you know. I, I didn't know what to do. And then the, the first thing he says, uh, I really love your movie. And I really love the way you make that, uh, you know, uh, romantic moment. This, it looks so different from the other movies that he had never seen it before. He already prepared a three years uh, director contract, you know, on his desk, you know, and then he said, okay, uh, this is a three years contract, will you, uh, will you please sign it, you know. I was so happy, you know, so, and then I, assigned, I, I signed it right, right away, you know. John Wu became Golden Harvest's only contract director, who soon proved his versatility by directing every popular genre, even Cantonese opera. He made a, a series of hits at Golden Harvest. I think his first hit was uh, Princess Chang Ping. After that, he made a series of comedies, um, very, actually very farcical comedies. <laughs> And he was already considered as uh, one of the best-selling director at that time. Riding on the success of his hits, John Wu signed a second long-term contract with Golden Harvest. But after eight comedies and three martial arts films, John felt the need for change. Comedies are very popular at that time. And uh, basically, if you don't want to make a comedy, uh, you would not be allowed to make any other kind of film. He always wanted to make pure drama, I think. But at that time, Golden Harvest simply would not allow him to do so. My kind of movies are always about uh, friendship and, and always about the code of honor and loyalty and you know, chivalry, you know. I always wanted to make a character-driven uh, movies, but the studio didn't believe in me. They just wanted me to follow the train. They had promised me when I start working with them, they will let me to do whatever I want, and, and, and they will let me to do, let me to make my dream movie. But I still didn't have a chance to do it, so I put my anger and my pain and my frustration into the comedy. So when the audience watch my comedy, they didn't know they should laugh or they should be angry. <laughs> I mean, it was a very repressed uh, period in his life at that time. I mean, at least creatively. Uh, I was so frustrated and I, uh, I was so depressed. It had made me drink a lot, you know, and I got uh, drunk all the time. And I remember that after a meeting, he called me one evening and he was very, very upset and he was almost in tears. And so he wanted to break away from Golden Harvest very much. You know, there's some of the people suggest me that I should retire and try to find a way to uh, start all over again. I was so angry, you know. And uh, even though some of my good friends, you know, they uh, said that uh, they kind of think to me, you know. But at that time, I have a, a, a so much strong belief in myself. And I, uh, uh, even though I was so, uh, uh, so upset, uh, uh, but I still believe I'm a good director. In the early 1980s, John left Golden Harvest and headed for Taiwan. But what he hoped would be new opportunities was yet again another comedy. It was on the set of this film, Run Tiger Run, that he met established Hong Kong actor-director Tsui Hak. Tsui Hak too was frustrated by the limited opportunities in the Hong Kong film industry. I was into a situation that where I, I'm, I didn't want to go into that direction anymore. I wanted to change. I didn't want to make any more comedy. I thought comedy was like too stiff in a way because there's no other room for other kind of movie. 
So it's, it's sort of like a, a stagnant period where nobody knows what's next. Uncertain about his next move, John Wu found himself at a crossroad in his career. Frustrated, John turned to Tsui Hak to find a way out of this creative dead end. And then he called me up and said he was not very happy about uh, the situation in Taiwan. He wanted to do something. That something was inspired by a 60s Hong Kong movie they both loved called Story of a Discharged Prisoner. It was such a, a classic, uh, wonderful movie, and also it had a lot of uh, new experiment in the film. The movie was about a guy who used to be the gang boss, but he wanted to make a change, and he also looking for the redemption. I saw that movie when I was in high school, and then both of us really loved that film a lot. John Wu, with Tsui Hak's guidance, decided to remake Story of a Discharged Prisoner. John's version proved to be more than a mere reinterpretation. It would change an entire industry. Uh, Tsui Hak, uh, he encouraged me to put my true feeling and, 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 and to put my you know, uh, uh, true um, uh, real experience in, into the character, into the scene. So this is sort of like a, a movie that we, we want to make because we, we, we put everything that we, we really love into the movie. And then uh, Choi Hak, he understood me uh, and he supported me. He was the only one who would uh, support me. We can call the movie Better Tomorrow for a reason actually is just because we really need a better tomorrow. <laughs> because that period of time we were really in best shape in the industry. And he took the uh, responsibility as a producer, you know, and led me to direct a film. It was a film that redefined the action genre and saw the birth of a new breed of Hong Kong action hero, the charismatic Chow Yun-Fat. After the uh, premiere, Chow Yun-Fat and I were so nervous because uh, after, the, after the movie finished, all of a sudden the whole theater was quiet. I thought we didn't hear uh, uh, anything and uh, we didn't hear any applause. And uh, we were so nervous, we were kept smoking, what happened, what happened. And then after silence for about a couple of minutes, all of a sudden the whole theater, they all applauded and, and they are, some people even stood up. Their labor of love paid off. A Better Tomorrow broke all Hong Kong box office records for 1985 and won Best Film at the Hong Kong Film Awards. Ni A Better Tomorrow introduced the ideal John Wu hero, the tall and debonair Chow Yun-Fat. And it gave Hong Kong viewers their first taste of John Wu's brand of filmmaking. You can always see people, you know, flying into the air, gunning each other out. This is John's style. You can see all this slow motion. This is John's style. I don't think anyone would have imagined that, you know, a contemporary action film can be done in that way. A Better Tomorrow was a, a revolutionary film in, for the Hong Kong movie industry and spawned a five-year period in which every month there was a copycat uh, imitation of A Better Tomorrow, another gangster film with slow-motion gunfights. One of the things that it did was bring the Hong Kong action movie into the late 20th century and replace the fists and swords of, this, of the martial arts era with guns. Nobody else before that had figured out how to take the Hong Kong spirit of action, which was involved with vengeance and bloodshed and blood brotherhood and all of that, and make crime films about it. And the obvious link that John found, which in retrospect seems intuitively obvious, is to say, well, the old swordplay heroes, the old clansmen of the Wuxia pictures are now the triads, they're now gangsters.
having reinvented Hong Kong films with a better tomorrow and bolstered by the hits that followed, John Woo set his sights on a much more elusive target. At 46, John Woo, the director, was going west. John Woo's films began to travel the international film festival circuit, winning him a cult following. John Woo has his signature pieces. He has, you know, he the way he implements slow motion techniques, uh, action movies, he's very intent on, on actors' eyes. He loves their eyes. Killer is, is probably, a, as far as I'm concerned, one of his best. It's a very early Hong Kong movie. It has all the elements that you look for in a John Woo movie. It was the killer that really made people take notice outside Hong Kong. All of a sudden, the, the, uh, the movie got so much good attention. And Terrence, he showed me all, all, all those good credits. I almost cried, and I had never expected it, you know. Terrence, John's business partner, passionately believed John Woo films could successfully play to an international audience. Terrence Chang was enormously important in the development of John's career. He was the person who saw the potential to develop John's fame and, and his reputation in America. And Terrence, I think, convinced him that if he played his cards right, it might even be possible, and worked single-mindedly to make that happen. My good friend, uh, Terrence Chang, after he saw the film, he really loved it. And then he took the film to travel all over the world, uh, saw the movie uh, in uh, all kinds of film festival. I took the films everywhere, to Cannes, to, to Toronto, and to Sundance. The Killer was, I guess, the first Hong Kong film to be shown at Sundance, and a lot of people were at a screening, including some actors and some studio people. The Killer's heightened melodrama was something new to a Western audience. They cheered and laughed at the same time, so they were kind of in awe, but it's not something they've seen before, so that's kind of an uneasiness, you know, they didn't know how to, exactly how to react to the film, but then, you know, it's fresh. <laughs> After that uh, film, all of a sudden, I've got a few calls, you know, from Hollywood. I was, uh, you know, pretty shocked, and I didn't know what to do, you know. I received uh, over 50 script, but most of the script was all about action. I was looking for a good action script, but it also had a very good meaning. John Woo's films caught the eye of Belgian martial arts film star Jean-Claude Van Damme. The Muscles from Brussels, as Van Damme was called, was making martial arts films in Hollywood and wanted John Woo to craft his next film, Hard Target. And Van Damme, he really loved my movies, he loved my style, and he wanted to be another Chow Yun fan. After I read a script, I, I found a, it had a very interesting uh, concept. The story was about the people hunting people, you know, I think it was uh, pretty interesting. If I can make it like the modern uh, restaurant, like a romantic love story, it would be nice, you know. And I also like to try to make a, a, a Hollywood movie. He just, he just wanted to do any American film, because, and also because um, they went to Hong Kong and courted him. John, we, we want you to do this, and he, he liked that, he liked courtships. They are trying to make me feel comfortable to work on their project. Everybody was so sincere, and, and it, it made me make the uh, decision, you know, that uh, willing to take the challenges. He left. He uprooted his whole, whole family, sold his apartment, and moved all his wife and kids uh, to L.A. <laughs> it was a very gutsy move. Ah, <laughs> 那是一定的，但是到美国呢，它绝对是一个新人的姿态出现。所以那时候呢，我们把香港的房子也就处理掉了，也没有多少钱。所以带到美国去的时候，只能真的是由零开始。It was the early 1990s. John Wu, with family in tow, found himself the new kid on the block. This was John's big break. He would be the first Chinese director to work on a big-budget Hollywood movie. When I got to Hollywood, uh, all of a sudden, uh, 
I feel like a, a, a stranger. Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, you should know how to speak. Honestly, it was a problem. It's a language. Not that it's so difficult to communicate with, with a Belgian actor. <laughs> and, uh, for the uh, script meeting, you know, everybody talk a lot. Of the writers, and, you know, the, uh, the actors and producers, they talk uh, a lot, you know. The very opening shot will now be... And then it become my turn, you know, is that they will expect me to, to make a long speech. Comedy shot, and then the, then the scene plays out. Very much the way. You know, I was saying that, and I didn't know what to say. You know, I just say, okay, I uh, I just wanted to make a, a, a modern western. You know, that was it. You know. <laughs> but the hard target John Woo envisioned was not the one that eventually played in theaters around the world. He wanted to make uh, an American mainstream film, but also wanted to keep his own style. Mike, how was the camera? A lot of times, you know, that kind of got in the way because he tried to elevate the, the genre. It's a Jean-Claude Van Damme picture. People said, you know, it's a Van Damme picture. You give them what the Van Damme fans want. But John said, I want it to be a little bit more and try to inject a lot of his style into it. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. People who go to see a Van Damme film just wanted to see him kick ass. You know, they don't care about those techniques. And so it didn't test it well. And then people ask, where are the martial arts? You know, we want to see a martial arts star do martial arts. <laughs> and so we have two days of reshooting have to have him, you know, kicking someone <laughs> some more. <laughs> They could never do the same thing like, you know, like, uh, like, uh, like a killer. For the Hollywood movie, they are pretty uh, clear, you know, it's uh, action, it's action. The action have never involved with the uh, heavy drama. Drama is drama, they will never mix up with the action. And the comedy is a comedy. Comedy will uh, never, you know, uh, involve with the, the other thing. Did that jump out too fast? No, no, I could, I no, no it's, okay. Okay. it's okay. Once again, John Wu hit a brick wall like he had in Hong Kong years before. And once again, he was determined to do it his way. I love human drama more than action. <laughs> of course, I love action film, but my kind of action has uh, uh, some meaning. So. But the studios weren't about to hand John the reins just like that. He had to earn their trust. There was still a lot of skepticism, let's put it frankly. The first movie he was hired to do was a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, which means he was not immediately hired to do a Tom Cruise movie. I mean, the implication is obvious. He was given an apprentice project to, to, to prove what he could do. Broken Arrow was John's second American film. He made Broken Arrow specifically in order to prove to people that he could make a movie that was totally American, American down to its bones, you know, that it didn't have anything to do with what he'd done in the past. Broken Arrow was not the vehicle for John's style of action drama, but it allowed him to impress a charismatic actor who was to prove instrumental to his future in America. I heard about John Woo through Quentin Tarantino whilst I was doing the movie Pulp Fiction, and he wanted me to see some of his work. I always uh, uh, believe uh, the good action uh, should be based on the, uh, the story and, uh, and the character. I really didn't want to make a film just for an action. In John Travolta, Wu found the ally he needed in Hollywood. He knows what he wants, and he has a, he's prepared. And anyone who's prepared and knows what they want always wins out over any kind of confrontation. The success of their collaboration paved the way for John Woo to earn his stripes as a bona fide Hollywood director on his own terms. And that's how we got started. And then later, of course, we did Face Off. Face Off was initially conceived as a futuristic action film, but John Woo was ready to craft it into the film he really wanted to make. A drama about family and duty, stylishly cloaked in scintillating action sequences. A 
originally it was a sci-fi movie. It's a very futuristic. There's a lot of a CG, a lot of a special effects thing, you know. But I had uh, I, I've changed uh, the concept. I uh, suggest uh, you know, cut down the uh, sci-fi thing, and then uh, put a focus on the drama, and also add uh, the family of value thing you know, in, into the film. John Travolta, who was already on board, used his clout to attract another box office superstar, Nicolas Cage. Travolta in turn talked to Nick Cage and said, oh, this, this is a great director, you, you got to work with him. And that's how <laughs> Nick Cage, I mean, one of the reasons why Nick Cage w went to work for on Face Off. And then Nick told other actors, you know, I, I think it's the word spread that way, you know. With Travolta and Cage locked in, Face Off, despite its John Woo-inspired non-Hollywood formula, got the green light. The film became the runaway summer hit of 1997, grossing over a quarter of a billion dollars. John Woo had arrived. People in Hollywood, I think, when they, when they think of John Woo, probably still think of him as a great technician of action. What I think of is someone who took the action genre and gave it a heart. A lot of what makes a director, um, you know, an A-list director in Hollywood is indeed the ability to attract stars. John does have this uh, ability to make star actors look great. Actors love that, I think. It's an action movie. Why just show a shot of a guy getting out of a car? But he is turned into a legendary figure just by the way the wings of his coat spread out in the way in the breeze and as he's moving along with his with, you know, silver guns around his waist. I think in this movie it's very clear that although you're getting commercial entertainment in the best way, mm -hmm. you're also, I think, getting a work of art in that this is John Woo's pure expression, which includes serious acting and character development and not just car chases and explosions. And, and you're getting both in this. I came up with ideas, and John let me go with it, which is, I said, what if my character misses his face and starts to admire it, and then he licks it, and then he does these threatening things in the way I asked if I could do that, and most directors would not have allowed me to go that far. God, I miss that face. After the success of Face Off, John Wu was clearly on his way up. He had his pick of projects, and the one he settled on was Mission Impossible 2, the action film franchise starring Tom Cruise. John lent his signature style to MI2, planting the seeds of a love story in the midst of spellbinding action. Tom Cruise and Dandy knew in the beginning, and they're just starting their relationship. You know, who would have thought that you would establish that relationship by two people racing in cars? But it was a little love dance there. That's John. He has great vision. So when I'm choreographing the gun barrel sequence, and I'm using the, uh, the musical, the rhythm, the camera movement, the, uh, uh, the editing to thinking of the scene. And then I'm using the beauty of the Kung Fu action to uh, 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 put it into the uh, 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 gunfight action. Mission Impossible 2 took in a half a billion dollars. And John was finally in charge. Working on uh, Mission Impossible 2, or uh, uh, Face Off, you know, I also could do the change uh, um, every day, you know. <laughs> Even though we had a, 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 a complete uh, you know, a storyboard, but uh, whenever I came up with you know, uh, some good idea or, or wanted to make some change, they allow me to uh, uh, to make a change because they also wanted to you know to uh, uh, to make a good movie. We've got a lot of pressure, you know, from work, you know, like uh, 
uh, especially in in this uh, business. This is only uh, my relaxing moment. It, 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 I could spend hours. I can spend three, two or three hours to prepare a meal. Sometimes uh, even I can uh, uh, um, spend the whole days just for preparing. You know. Uh, the, um, uh, the meal. You know, just like uh, cooking a meal, you know, so I also cooking with love, you know, because I, I love myself, I love my families, and I love my kids, I love my friends. I put my heart uh, you know, for the, uh, in the, into the cooking. I just, uh, if you really care about somebody, you will know how to make something good, you know, for them. John Woo next chose to make Wind Talkers, a war movie with themes that were close to his heart. I had to uh, put my focus, you know, on the friendship. You know. I, I think that it really fit in my uh, philosophy. Wind Talkers also was about uh, two different kind of people. They came from a different world. At the beginning, they didn't get along. They had a lot of conflict, you know, but uh, during the war, you know, they have learned how to, you know, to, to love each other, you know, and, and, and become friends, you know. Wind Talkers had all the classic elements of a John Woo film, but it was also richly American. It celebrated the unsung heroes of the Native American Navajo tribe who fought in the Second World War. The Navajo Code Talkers used their language to encrypt military codes, making them unbreakable. I'm very proud uh, for making that film. And I thought that that film really had sent a good uh, message. The message about friendship, the message about peace, the message about care. Uh, and also made me learn so much uh, from the Navajo people, one of the tribes uh, in, uh, in America. Uh, they really gave a lot of great uh, contribution for the country. That's a, 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 a the real message that I wanted to say you know, from uh, uh, Wind Talkers. In 2001, John Wu was invited to the White House to honor the Navajo Code Talkers. Although Wind Talkers was not a big hit, it was a defining moment for the Hong Kong director, for he had helped his adopted country salute some of its finest soldiers. I don't feel like a stranger anymore. I feel like I'm a part of the family. Uh, when I got the opportunity to go to Hollywood, you know, I, uh, there's only one word I can say, I'm grateful. Today, John Wu is deeply immersed in Americana, this time taking on a television pilot, a remake of the popular 60s sci-fi show, Lost in Space. Okay. Okay. But the quick camera continue going. The story is about um, dysfunctional family uh, they had uh, all kind of problem. Somehow, when they are uh, traveling in outer space, and uh, uh, they have to deal with so many different kind of uh, awful situation, and they have learned uh, how to work together and come together. Just, just on the door close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Then they both and then a poof, like yeah. into the door. Yeah, yeah. holding each other. Holding That's great. Each other, yeah. and a lot of uh, great uh, special effects, uh, interesting action, you know, and also it had a very uh, strong. Uh, and emotional yeah, that drama. Sure that it's running to the explosion that makes him yeah. heroic and not a chicken dad. I'm not only interested in making a, a big budget movie, and actually, uh, I've got tired of making the, the you know the uh, big movies. I find uh, uh, the biggest movie always have the biggest problem. So that's why uh, sometimes I like to uh, try something smaller, you know. All of a sudden, pen. Just he just right here. <laughs> 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 I mean, I uh, use this kind of suspense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we see the... I think he has to be careful when choosing his next project. And unlike when he first came here, you know, okay, I just want to make a film, get experience, do a Van Damme movie. Instead of saying yes to those kind of generic action films, you got to really do the films that you feel passionate about. Your part, you yes. continue to see the guy. If we're doing this in conventional film, what frame rate do we want all this to be happening at? at, at which and point? I think he's about to enter his fourth phase, which is, you know, more character-driven, you know, drama, maybe with some action and maybe not. I, I don't know. 
you know, that's not that kind of topics I really wanted to do, you know. Since I have an opportunity to work in Hollywood, sometimes I see myself as a bridge. I really wish I could uh, do a project. I could uh, bring in the, the good thing from the West and the good thing from the East, you know. I uh, try to uh, combine it in a movie, you know, and, and, and let, let us know each other more. There is little doubt building bridges is as much as John Woo trademark as are his slick, choreographed action dramas. This is a Steve Rock Cock. Very good. Melt in your mouth. John, when are you going to do a musical? No, no, no. no. <laughs> it, it's not really a musical. It's, a, uh, it's a, a pretty much like a cabaret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a gangster movie with, 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 with a lot of dancing. <laughs> you know, John quite dance. often the actors will say, like Nicholas Cage, John Travolta, well, John, show me how to do this. And he will do an exquisite performance. Say, okay, now I know what to do. And, and do it. His hidden talent, he's a great actor. Don't listen. Oh, wow. oh, cheers, everybody. Thank uh, you so cheers. much. Cheers. Cheers. It's all about fate. The, the, I have never dreamed to be a filmmaker, and I have never dreamed to go to any uh, other country, you know. So when I got here, I just had to feel uh, I'm pretty lucky, you know. Okay. Um, it's just like a dream.